So right now we're focused on getting out this Urban3 data that we just acquired. Urban3 is a firm out of North Carolina. They look at property tax revenues and local infrastructure and create this value per acre model that is quite interesting and really eye-opening. If you think about the way we develop today, the way that local governments look at development projects, they look at it almost the same way you look at a miles per tank analysis of a car, which is kind of ridiculous because that doesn't tell you anything about the car. You know, Ford F-150 can get you more miles per tank than a Ford Focus or a Prius, but we measure in terms of miles per gallon. That's a much more effective way to measure the efficiency of a vehicle. So why don't we do the same with measuring the efficiency of our developments? And Urban3 does that with their value per acre analysis so that you can do direct comparisons between small homes and larger homes, between mom and pop shops and the giant shopping centers that most of our towns have. It shows us that the old way we used to build, the mixed use, walkable, historic cores are far more valuable and potent than our newer, more suburban or car focused transportation or, um, developments. And it really just comes down to geometry. If you look at, for instance, downtown Chestertown, all the buildings are close together. All the streets are narrower. You have residential right next to commercial, right next to parks and schools. That wasn't done by mistake. That was done with very focused intent, knowing that the more people we could fit, more homes we could fit on a street, the more people we have contributing to the ongoing maintenance of the street and the maintenance of the community. When we start to spread everything apart, that's when we overbuild our infrastructure and we underbuild our value, which I think is what we're running into today. So I think a lot of local governments, they're feeling pressure in their budgets, whether it's because of our housing crisis, transportation cuts at the state level, whether it is meeting the effects of climate change through adaptation and becoming more resilient, or the pressure from education, from the Kerwin blueprint. And a lot of them are looking to develop, to grow as a way to fill in those funding gaps. When you have a new development come in, towns and counties are flush with cash from all the new property tax revenues. And they're given this huge amount of infrastructure, which at was, which was built at the cost of a developer and given over to local governments, sometimes through um, uh, neighborhood associations. But that's short term. Eventually, you're going to have to start replacing that infrastructure and you're going to not have all those property tax revenues. So you can only do that so many times before you run out of land or you run out of your growth area. So if you do that right now, you're denying future generations the ability to grow to meet their needs as well. And what we should do instead is look to having smarter, more productive developments. We should look to areas that are underproducing and find a way to redevelop them incrementally so that they can be more productive. And I think you can see that stark difference between the historic cores and what we've been building since the 1950s which is very car-focused development styles, the suburban and the strip malls and such. Yeah, so we have this data from Urban 3, and it includes data for the entire Eastern Shore minus Cecil County. So for eight, eight counties on the Eastern Shore and their municipalities. And, that, and we're having two events on October 22nd, one in Cambridge, the other one at Chesapeake College. And we've invited all the local governments as well as state agencies to attend uh, to learn about this data and sort of what it, sh what it shows. We had a sustainable growth workshop back in May. We had former ESLC staffer Brad Rogers, who's a planner and developer in Baltimore. He spoke about this golden goose idea. He said, all of our historic communities are in and of themselves their own golden goose. They are the most productive development types in their communities. Think of downtown Chestertown, Rock Hall, Denton, Cambridge, Easton, Salisbury. These are places that were built uh, before planning, before we had cars, before we had this suburban style dominant development. And these are our golden goose. They lay a golden egg for our local governments every year in the form of high property tax revenues, a huge return on investment in these historic cores. 
but we've made them illegal to replicate. If you look at downtown Chestertown, we love this downtown so much that we've created a historic district, a historic district commission designed to protect its integrity and its value. Yet through our zoning, we've made it illegal to replicate this type of value anywhere else in town. Nowhere else in town can you have this type of density or just rely on off-street parking or have the mixed use where living downtown, you can walk to any number of shops, uh, theater, grocery store, parks, schools, the waterfront. Through our zoning, we've made it illegal and we've required people to own cars in order to access basically everything they need. So what we're hoping is we can just begin to reverse that, to ask the local governments to think, how is my parking minimum requirements for harming my development? How is my zoning, the setbacks, the easements, the requirements, the, the density, the number of units per acre, the uh, segmenting commercial on one side, industrial on this side, residential on this side, which requires people to drive all in that triangle, but without having it mixed up in a fluid and natural way. Uh, Urban 3 makes a point in their presentations that our local governments are in and of themselves uh, industries, or they are you know, commercial enterprises. Uh, they are incorporated. And they should think of themselves in some ways as a business, and your business is land use. You provide land and you get property tax revenues from that land use, almost like a landlord and tenants. But knowing having this data and seeing what parts of your communities are more productive than others is incredibly powerful for any business to have to have that kind of data knowing this product uh, gives me a better return on investment than this product so i should start selling more of this product and not so much of this product you know, business doesn't have to be 100 percent profitable all the time but they do need to have some profit in order to be sustainable